morning, everybody. I'm sorry I cannot speak Slovenian. I believe that most of you can speak Portuguese. Anyway, I'll be speaking in, in English. Our Latin of uh, the ages, our modern Latin, where everybody meets. Thank you for uh, your invitation to be here today. Thank you to my colleague, to my colleague Barbara uh, Jurcic. Thank you to my colleague Gregor uh, Pobetzin. I don't know if uh, it's like this. Barbara wrote it down here, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm in Slovenia and in Ljubljana for the first time in my life. I hope I'll be here many, many times in the future. And um, uh, the fact that I'm here is uh, direct, uh, uh, related to uh, uh, José Saramago's centenary, which we are celebrating this year. And uh, my presence here this morning is uh, not only in the condition of um, the coordinator, as Barbara said, of the uh, Saramago centenary, but also due to the fact that I've been studying the work of Saramago uh, during the last 20 years or so. So my contribution to this uh, symposium this morning will be a lecture, uh, which I hope will not be too much boring for you, on uh, one of the main aspects of uh, Saramago's heritage, meaning uh, what I call the afterlife of José Saramago. The afterlife of José Saramago as represented in his literary and social thought meaning that uh, when we are commemorating José Saramago's centenary, I feel that it is worth opening up and then deepening an area of reflection which I will endeavor to justify as pertinent. I am referring to what I consider the evidence of the afterlife of a great writer that is the enduring nature of his literary and social thought. This expression refers to a wide range of texts written by José Saramago in interaction with his literary work over a period of time that begins in the 1980s and lasts until his death. I contemplate, then, a set of notions and principles which are deduced from the literary practice conceived and carried out by a singular writer. We are not, then, facing a structured theory. The literary doctrine of José Saramago is circumstantial because it derives from a praxis that makes the writer responsible without imposing a norm. Even without aspiring to be a dogma, Saramagian thinking is not insignificant, especially since the writer assumed the role of a figure of reference, capable of influencing the literary output of his time and that of the time that followed. Something similar can be said about those texts that I call social intervention texts, texts that I do not separate from literary doctrine. In other words, there is no such thing as a literary Saramago and a social thinker Saramago, isolated from one another, since both are sides of the same coin. To this, I would add two observations. The first is that, as has been said about literary doctrine, José Saramago does not seek to construct a treatise on political and social philosophy with rigid argumentative support. 
Rather, it is an explanation of coherent thought. Secondly, in Saramago, chronological order indicates a certain change of interests and priorities. This change means that since the end of, la of the last century, there has been an intensification of a public speaking element driven by the demands that have caused the novelist to travel through the world of congresses and civic actions, interviews, roundtables and political statements. I would like to draw attention to a text that confirms the expression change of interests and priorities. I refer to the self-analytic exercise that Saramago entitled this From Statue to Stone, which comes from a conference given in Turin, Italy, in 1997. In it, we can read right at the opening. For some time now, I have been saying that I am less than the less interested in talking about literature. The truth is that I really doubt that one can talk about literature, as I doubt, with greater reason, that one can talk about painting or one can talk about music. I do not read these words as a manifesto of reduction to silence in literary and artistic matters since the rejection of silence is well expressed immediately afterwards. It would be absurd to claim, Saramago's words, it would be absurd to claim to reduce to silence those who write or those who read or those who feel or those who compose music or who paint or who sculpt as if the work itself already contain everything that it is possible to say. The truth, however, is that the writer Saramago recognizes in artistic work an ineffable that is that which cannot be explained. In a chronicle of the same year, 1997, he returns to his disinterest in talking about literature and says with evident sarcasm, literary discourses, those that literature makes and those that are made about it, seem to me more and more like a choir of angels hovering on high. When we wander through the set of texts that make up Saramago's literary and social thought, we notice how various structural themes become evident in them. One of these themes is obviously history, its literary inscription and its effects in this course. It is not surprising that this should be the case. In fact, the fictional representation of history has been, within a postmodernist framework, one of the most vigorously considered issues referring to questions such as the change of literary genres, the parodic impulse that derives from it, counterfactuality as a provocation, and the questioning of historical knowledge. In other words, a large part of what we read in a much-quoted text by Saramago, History and Fiction, from 1990. What is at stake in that text is a notion of the relationship between fiction and history that, based on the lesson of Georges Duby, is grounded on the overcoming of the logic and aesthetics of the 19th century historical novel. The great Georges Duby, Saramago recalls, was the one who, in the first line of one of his books, wrote let us imagine that." End quote. In other words, Saramago draws from the referred Annal school a predisposition for an interaction between history and fiction, which allows the latter, fiction, to complete the former, 
history and to understand as characters with historical dignity figures not contemplated by mainstream historiography. I will stop here with regard to this matter precisely because it has been much studied in Saramago's work. I would just like to recall that his almost first novel, Manual of Painting and Calligraphy of 1976, ends with an explicit allusion to a moment of drastic political and historical change, namely the revolution of April 1974. Quote, the, re the regime fell, a military coup as expected. This is followed by the perplexity of a storyteller confronted with history in progress. Quote, I do not know how to describe today the troops, the tanks, the happiness, the embraces, the words of joy, the nervousness, the sheer jubilation. End quote. I shall now allude briefly to the topic of the relationship between history and fiction. One such topic, the consideration of a new novel. For Saramago, this new novel is to be understood as a genre that is simultaneously deconstructed and composed, fluent and eclectic, in a more explicit way. A literary place capable of receiving, like, like a great convulsing sonorous sea, the torrential tributaries of poetry, drama, essay, and also of philosophy and science, becoming the expression of a knowledge, a wisdom, a world vision, as the great poems of classical antiquity had been in their own time. I will, now, I will now concentrate myself on the text from allegory as genre to allegory as a necessity, which comes from José Saramago's participation in a conference held in Rome in 2003. It is one of the most express, expressive testimonies of what the Saramagian literary culture was, along with the insistence of the tutelary names of a certain genealogical tree. In this case, Kafka and Father Antonio Vieira, the 17th century Jesuit preacher, as well as, bearing in mind the issue of allegory, Gil Vicente, the so-called founder of Portuguese theater, and Esad Queiroz, our great novelist. At the same time, this reflection allows Saramago to confirm the milestones of his literary output and thought. The novel's blindness and the gospel, according to Jesus Christ, define decisive moments in this context. The first is an expressive example of the so-called allegory of situation. I will return to this concept. At one and the same time, it attests the arrival in Saramago's work of the time when one passes into the interior of the stone. This is a Saramago's expression. There where the stone will know that it is stone, but not that it is statue. End quote. As if to say, one seeks the very essence of meaning. We cannot get here without the masterpiece that is the gospel according to Jesus Christ. Sorry. Back in business. Uh, okay, let us uh, not be confused. The singular, when associated with allegory, is not that which is simple and even less primary. The singularity refers to the transhistorical sense of the allegorical, and also to a novel that is governed by ethical and philosophical reflection. In it, the register of the essay is nurtured, for that is what this novel contains 
of the investigation of the complex. Saramago's words, after the time in which it was systematic reportage of social life, the novel transitions to a new role which faces a parallel task for which it did not seem to have been born, that of reflecting. Allegory and the characters who embody it are the center of this new role. The Saramagian project of the postmodernist recuperation of allegory is based on principles from which I would like to highlight the three most significant ones. First, allegory overcomes the logic of 19th century realism. A number of Saramago's novels from the 1919s onwards tell stories set in places without any defined location and are lived out by characters of diffuse composition and sometimes unknown names. I call this the reduction of the narrative concreteness. The second principle, having overcome the social and ideological purposes that once characterized it, the novel becomes a quest, a search for the human being. As such, it tends to become a space, a great ocean in which all the rivers of literary expression will flow. A beautiful image that Saramago completes death. The work of a speleologist without lamps or ropes to which the writer dedicates himself perhaps finds a new direction in this novel exposed to the four winds, in this literary space in which all the waters of creation converge. End quote. Third and finally, Kafka reappears as the inspire of allegory. For Saramago, the author of the trial is the founder of an allegory of situation such as we find in blindness, in all the names, in the cave, or in the double. And also before this, in the stone raft, when the Iberian Peninsula sails towards the thought and the new utopias. For all intents and purposes, the character remains a fundamental element in understanding the novel as a narrativization of allegorical situations. At the core of that movement is the character. For example, the doctor's wife, the dog of tears, Cipriano Algor, and the, the death or death the later death in the novel, The Intermittences of Death, as allegorical figures, a condition that is reinforced by the impulse towards personifying individualization. As it has already been said, personification conveys abstract ideas by giving them a body, but it cannot also represent a general type, a character abstract ideas, which in short are allegorical sentiments. It makes no sense to think that an essay about an apparently technical notion such allegory weakens the social responsibility element of Saramago's thought. On the contrary, in harmony with the transhistorical sense of the allegorical, social responsibility takes on a new, wider scope with strong ethical implications that are not at all abstract. Saramago's words, ethics, which should be applied as common sense demands, that is to say, for each concrete social case, ethics is the, it is the least abstract of all things and always remains as a silent and rigorous presence that asks for accounts every day. End quote. It should, it should also be noted that Saramago does not enter into, into the matter, his characterization of allegory, without first highlighting the meaning of the representations of power, the oppression of some peoples by others, the imminence 
of a global catastrophe, the threats to peace and the duty to counteract them. We find these concerns in texts situated in a period of time that goes from the mid-1990s until the writer's death. In one of these texts, we read, we know that horror in, its man in all its manifestations, the cruelest, the most atrocious and infamous, sweeps over and haunts our unhappy planet every day like a curse. And soon after, Saramago again, Africa seems to have become the place where horror feels most at ease to commit offenses that we would judge to be inconceivable. End quote. I'm almost finishing. Sarmagian discourse enunciating, enunciated without any concession to euphemism is not limited to the circumstances of those episodes, but drifts into themes that resonate in literary works. I stress the scope of three of these themes. Firstly, the relationship with God repeatedly accused of alienation from man and of an arbitrary impulse towards cruelty. At least two of Saramago's novels, The Gospel According to Jesus Christ and Cain, are inseparable from that accusation. Second theme, the failure of institutions that the supposed will of God generated and human societies adopted, but which were incapable of serving the humiliated and the offended. Thirdly, the question of the other, that is the change of, the challenge of understanding outside Eurocentric references, the dignity and the right to difference observed, for instance, in Mexico, in the mountains of Chiapas, and in the people who asserted their own identity there. I insist the reflection that we read in the text I have just commented on is the other face of the great themes dealt with in Saramago's narrative fiction and drama. Some of these themes, man's violence towards his fellow man, the indifference of God to the suffering of his creators, the, res the resistance of the weak to oppression, the fragility of the individual subject to the guardianship of powers with an invisible face, the inability to recognize the difference in the other. I dwell on this last theme to recall that A Viage in Wilfant, The Elephant's Journey, 2008, the Sarmagian motif of the journey brings with it the representation of that difference in a context of the refiguration of history taken up by the novelist nearing the end of his literary life. I don't need to go any further to affirm, to affirm. José Saramago is alive. His thought is still as current as ever and capable of anticipating the future. This is what many people ha have recently realized, reading in his essay on blindness, a message that pointed and points to the collective evils and fears we have been living through, through on a global scale, and also to the selfishness that they foster, as it is well suggested in a novel in which man reappears as a wolf of man, emptied of solidarity, and consumed by fears without hope of redemption. That is why I have said and will continue to repeat, Saramago is alive. His centenary will be a confirmation of that enduring afterlife that we are meant to live with. The works he left us, the values he represented, the ideas and causes he defended. And so it will be now and for as long as there are readers enlightened by his words. Thank you very much.